15 Things You Didn't Know About Peter Marino Welcome to Alux.com, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. Hello Aluxers, we're very excited to have you with us today as we talk about one of the most successful luxury architects and designers, Peter Marino. He's the principal architect of Peter Marino Architect PLLC, an internationally acclaimed architecture planning and design firm founded in 1978 and based in New York City, however with several offices around the US like Philadelphia, Miami, and so on. Marino's design contributions are worldwide, emphasizing material, texture, scale, light, and the constant dialogue between interior and exterior. He's widely known for his residential and retail designs for the most iconic names in the fashion and art worlds alike. Notable and recently completed retail projects include Hermengil Dozenia, flagships in Paris, Milan, New York, Tokyo, and Shanghai. Chanel boutiques in Paris, New York and Singapore, and so much more. Also notable hospitality projects, including the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda in Sardina and Four Seasons Resort in Santa Barbara. Currently, Peter Marino is designing numerous private residences around the world, including in London, Paris, and Palm Beach. Peter Marino is the world's most sought-after architect of luxury fashion stores and has designed a series of flagships and boutiques for an extensive list of clients that include Louis Vuitton, Armani, Xenia, Calvin Klein, Fendi, and Christian Dior. Characterized by their innovative use of light and space and integration of contemporary artwork, Marino's designs are credited with redefining the standard of upmarket retail design and have been nominated for a number of awards, such as the AIA Excellence in Design Award. Marino graduated from Cornell's College of Architecture, Art and Planning in 1971, working in established firms Skidmore Ownings and Merrill, George Nelson and I. M. P. Casuta and Ponte, before launching his own namesake firm. If you're new here, welcome! Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Alux. Marino serves as a member of a number of international organizations, including the board of the New York Foundation for Architecture. But that's enough with the intro. Let's get to the 15 things you didn't know about Peter Marino. Number 1. He had a disease as a child that prevented him from walking. He had an undisclosed childhood disease and he didn't walk until he was 7 years old. During this time, he began drawing. He had a pencil in his hand and was drawing from three years old. That's really the origin of his creativity. He also played piano and made music very dramatically, but when puberty hit, he slammed down the piano and said, I will never play again. I'm going to be an artist. Number 2. His motorcycle obsession was triggered by a doctor's appointment. In a routine checkup, the doctor said to him, If I told you right now that you had cancer and a month to live, what would you do? He said, I would get a bike and ride, and if it was too painful, I'd go off a cliff and die happy. The doctor told him he better start doing that right now. But he paused for a second and said, You don't have cancer, but you're getting to a certain age and I want you to enjoy your life. From that moment on, his obsession with motorcycles and the attire was born. Now his signature look is full-on biker. Black leather pants, boots, and cap with a tight black t-shirt over bulging biceps and often a pair of black shades. When speaking on his attire choices, he said, I was wearing the leathers to ride the bike to work and I'd come into the office and take my leathers off and put on what? Normal clothes? So I stopped putting on normal clothes. Number 3. Marino won an AIA Institute Honor Award in 2007, Marino won an honor award from the American Institute of Architects for his semi-transparent Louis Vuitton boutique in Hong Kong. Number 4. One of his first fashion clients was Calvin Klein. Marino designed Calvin Klein's first freestanding store. He described Klein as being very precise and exact with what he wanted. This opportunity played a key role in the direction of his design career. Number 5. Business is booming. In one year's time, his 150 employee firm completed 100 projects, and none of them had budgets under $5 million. Only 10 had budgets under $10 million. The firm brings in a revenue of about $25 million a year. One of the more notable houses Marino has designed is a $27.5 million mansion in Dallas, Texas. The estate features hand-painted wallpaper, his and hers libraries, and 14 unique fireplaces imported from Europe. 
One of the sitting rooms is a replica of one found in fashion designer Valentino's home in Rome. They had to tear down two houses to get the land. Residents don't have to go far to find ample entertainment options. The home features both indoor and outdoor swimming pools and a private lake. Number 6. Marino is an avid art collector Marino is an art collector, collecting French porcelain, contemporary paintings, modern art, and French and Italian bronzes from the mid-16th to the mid-18th century. Marino's collection of bronzes was displayed at London's Wallace Collection in 2010. His office serves as his own personal art gallery. His favorite carved African tribal sculptures stand on plinths around his private office like sentinels. Robert Mapplethorpe photographs line his walls. A small fraction of his 142-piece collection of the photographer, the world's largest in private hands. A fuller scope of his taste, which was celebrated in a show of his collection at the Bass Museum in 2015, can be absorbed around the office. There's work by Anselm Kiefer, which Marino has 12 in his Aspen home. Richard Prince Antoine Poncet, Thomas Struth, Johann Creighton, Armand, Joel Morrison, and Nancy Grossman, to name a few. Number 7. He has a custom pen collection with Carandash. When the foundation of your design empire is drawing, it's only right to have your very own pen on the market. In the various Peter Marino special edition version, leather combined with hand lacing allows the personality of the fountain and rollerball pens to come to the fore. The cap is topped with a silver and rhodium plated skull with black onyx eyes, reminiscent of the numerous rings Marino wears on his hands. The number of pieces in the edition, 150, refers to the address of the breathtaking studio in Manhattan, 150 East 58th Street. There, Peter Marino Architect occupies 16,000 square feet of two floors of some of the most coveted office space in New York City, furnished with museum quality art from Marino's private collections. The second version of the pen, the Varius Peter Marino Limited Edition, is also dressed in leather and is available as a fountain pen, rollerball pen, and ballpoint. And in a nod to fashion, fine gray stitching runs the length of the instrument. The cap reveals Marino's signature along with a unique limited edition number, which is engraved on the pen. And the number of pens in the edition pays homage to the date when he established his first studio in New York, 1978. Marino turned 68 on August 9th. Number 8. Even though he's in his 60s, he has the sleeping habits of a college student. Running an extravagant architecture firm for wealthy clients can be exhausting. Marino says he's like a sleep hibernation camel. When projects are getting busy, he'll go on only 4 hours of sleep a night and then come home and sleep for 72 hours straight. Number 9. He chose to study architecture at Cornell only because of its extensive art program. He took two years of sculpture, two years of life drawings, and two years of painting. He went to university when he was very, very young. He was just 16 years old. At that point in the 60s, it was still really a Beaux Arts education, and it was one of the last Beaux Arts architecture schools. Marino has a big art portfolio, and he wanted to be Andy Warhol. He even wants to get a commercial art job just like him, but it was very hard. He was in a class of 60 students, and they only graduated 11. It was really an unpleasant experience for him. But he did what most A-Luxers do. He persevered through his challenges and accomplished his goal. Number 10. He designed a house for Andy Warhol. Marino's career started with Andy Warhol, whom he met through Paul Hackett, who was a friend of a friend of his from architecture school. He started lurking around the factory on weekends and eventually became a part of the crew. This was during the 70s when Warhol was doing lots of society portraits and the Agnellis and Rothschilds took a shine to Marino and as he puts it, someone had to design their houses. Warhol hired Marino to do his own house on East 66th Street in partnership with Jed Johnson and then to design the factory when it moved to the north side of Union Square. And then came Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger, who had an enormous apartment in the Pierre, and then eventually the Pressman family, who were in the process of converting Barney's, their bar mitzvah suit company, into something fashionable and fantastic. Who better than the architect of the factory? As a fourth-year student at Cornell University's undergraduate architecture school, the young Marino returned to his native New York to attend a satellite program the university operated in the city at the time. 
Marina recalls that Cornell rented a full-floor building on 17th Street, right across from art dealers Max's Kansas City and Warhol's factory. The combination art studio, movie studio, and industrial-scale workshop for coolness, operated by the wig-wearing pop art maven. Warhol famously made no bones about the commercial character, not just of his artwork, but of his entire modus operandi. But Andy never showed off Peter's work, sealing off his townhouse to practically everyone. His private life was exactly that. So everyone would say, oh, I'm sure when people see Andy's house, your career is going to take off. But nobody really saw the house until he died in 1986. Number 11. He has three distinct ways of speaking. There is the default speech, which bears traces of his native Queen's accent that he had hired a childhood coach to lose it. But sometimes it's there, and in which most sentences begin and or end with an enthusiastic dude. The word fucking is a top adjective, and there's this whole third person thing, or the Pedro, which he adopted after an article in a Spanish magazine referred to him as Pedro el Grande, Peter the Great. He'll use that in a variety of contexts, like when he's giving a tour of the Chanel boutique in Soho, where he curls up on a leather banquette in the dressing room and purrs, the Pedro loves leather. Or when he's asked if he wears Chanel's newest men's fragrance and answers, fragrance is not allowed in the clubs where the Pedro goes. He also uses it to explain the 30-year absence he took from riding bikes. I wanted to wait until my daughter was a teenager, he says, in case the Pedro checks out. And then, sometimes he lapses into a full English accent. Not a posh one, exactly. One that's more London and calls to mind the swinging 60s along King's Road. He uses this one frequently when he's talking about his wife, Jane Trapnell, and he talks about her a lot. She's gorgeous, he'll say. Just brilliant. Number 12. He's claustrophobic. Marino's most important aesthetic motivation may be his claustrophobia. He's quoted as saying, I can't even take a shower. Because of his claustrophobia, Marino's first mission with any space is to open it up and access all available natural light. He says, just ask any woman. He's even asked his wife. He says, she has a very humanistic take on things. And she always says, you need light. Number 13. His earliest clients are fashion icons. With the Barney's job, Marino started meeting people. He flew to Milan to meet Giorgio Armani and Carlo Fendi, and to Paris to meet the Hermes people. Eventually, he attended the ready-to-wear shows, standing on his tiptoes in the back of the house. Peter says, there's so much effort in a fashion show. There's so much beauty. There are these kinds of massive mixed arts things. They rarely achieve the overall beauty of a painting, but the humanity is off the charts. They're collaborative. They're operatic. Marino has found a home in the fashion world as well, and by the early 90s, he was designing boutiques for Calvin Klein, Giorgio Armani, and Donna Karen. Number 14. In 2016, Fidon published the book Peter Marino Art Architecture. The book documents more than 250 site-specific contemporary artworks Marino has commissioned to seamlessly mesh art and architecture. This is the first book to look at the collaborative process by which Marino has commissioned site-specific works to live within his designs for luxury retail spaces from artists including Richard Deakin, Vic Munitz, Vanessa Beecroft, James Turrell, Not Vital, and Jean-Michel Othoniel. Marino's commissions explore the relationship between art and architecture. The process of these collaborations is documented here through personal anecdotes, notes, diaristic photographs, and sketches, culminating in beautifully photographed images of the final work. Number 15. He released a book dedicated to the garden of his Hampton home. The Garden of Peter Marino is a book that highlights his work in landscape architecture. In the introduction of his book, Peter said he had this Alice in Wonderland idea in his head that a garden should be a place of wonderment. He says the French use gardens to show grandeur, and the English to show how things have endured for hundreds of years, but for him, they're all about fantasy. Even a cursory glance around the grounds proves that fantasy is indeed in the air, but for an architect, a mix of order and chaos also comes to encapsulate his garden. Peter explained, We have a thousand hydrangea plants bordering the house, and they are supposed to all be pink, but a handful of them kept turning purple. 
What you learn is that you can't control everything, and invariably, the most interesting parts of the garden are the accents, the bits that don't conform to a plan. Do you think Peter Marino's experience with Andy Warhol reflects in his work today? Let us know in the comments below. And as a reward for sticking with us all the way to the end, here's a bonus fact just for you. According to Marino, he orders up probably more art for Chanel and Louis Vuitton than he does for his private clients. It's a vast amount. He says he's even working on a book about it. He says he likes the cross-fertilization of doing commercial and residential. He'll design a carpet for somebody and then say, okay, let's blow it up eight times and digitize it, and then we'll get something for a commercial job. Thank you for spending some time with us, Aluxers. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss another video. We also handpicked these videos, which we recommend you watch next. Thank you for being an Aluxer, and we'll see you back tomorrow.